Good evening. Well, uh, thank you, Chad, for those, uh, those kind words. And thank you for putting me on after that uh, wonderful performance. How do, you, how do you top that, you know? Uh, thank you, though, for those kind words, for your friendship, your leadership, and for all that you and your team at the Human Rights Campaign do to advance the fight for civil rights and LGBTQ equality. Now, I am proud to stand with all of you this evening. And I'm especially proud of all that we have accomplished together. In the years that I was privileged to serve as our nation's Attorney General, LGBTQ rights were at the forefront of the Justice Department's civil rights agenda. And many of the, the allies and advocates in this room were at my side for every policy argument, every legislative battle, and every courtroom fight. With your help and with compassionate common sense, intellectually driven leadership in the White House, we saw a seismic shift in our nation's policies and laws, as well as our national discourse and culture. Now, it's pretty remarkable to think that at the start of the Obama administration, only two states, Massachusetts and Connecticut, allowed same-sex couples to marry. All right, we'll see it for them. But thanks to Oberfeld v. Hodges, same-sex marriage is legal in every state and the District of Columbia. As recently as, as 2009, the U.S. military's discriminatory ban, don't ask, don't tell, was still firmly in place. Well, fortunately today, despite the hateful actions and the tweets of those who would deny transgender people the opportunity to serve, all qualified Americans can wear the uniform of their country. And they are protected against hate crimes under the Matthew Shepard and James Byrd Jr. Hate Crimes Prevention Act, the first LGBTQ federal law in U.S. history. Now, many of you fought tirelessly and sacrificed greatly for these victories. But no one more than my dear friend, Judy Shepard, who we're honored to have with us tonight. It's because of activists like Judy and organizations like HRC that the Obama administration was able to drive once unimaginable progress. You were there, and you fortified me. You fortified me in early 2011 when I announced that the United States Department of Justice would no longer defend the Defense of Marriage Act. And then, with your advocacy and support, as I announced at your meeting in New York in 2014, we extended critical benefits to Americans in same-sex marriages. We also increased the number of openly gay judges on the federal bench. We took meaningful steps to stop harassment, bullying, and abusive behavior directed at young LGBTQ people and to ensure greater fairness in our housing, health care, education, immigration, and economic policies. Now, with the leadership of Vice President Biden, we also secured the passage of a strengthened Violence Against Women Act that included new provisions covering LGBTQ survivors of domestic abuse. Now, that's a, a pretty wide range of accomplishments. And yet, our work is far from over. The unfortunate fact is that in 2018, America's long struggle to overcome injustice, to eliminate disparities, and to eradicate violence continues. The age of bullies and bigots is not fully behind us. And much of the progress that we made together now hangs in the balance. We have not yet solidified the gains made for gays and lesbians or fully expanded these rights to transgender Americans. And far too many people in this country are victimized because of who they are or who they love. There are still hearts to open, there are laws to change, and the need for leaders who reflect or even seem to grasp our nation's core values. Now, instead of trying to build consensus toward common goals, they try to build walls. 
and stoke fear and anger among a small faction of voters for short-term political advantage. They are willing to, to separate families at our borders, to take babies, babies from their parents, to deny the contributions of immigrants and the gift that is our immigrant heritage, to ban entry to refugees and U.S. visa holders because of their religion, and to exploit dreamers as a political bargaining chip. They question the credibility and the competence of judges. They undermine both the expected apolitical nature of law enforcement and the independence of the Justice Department and Special Counsel Bob Mueller. They incite violence against journalists. They favor corporate interests over our environment. They alienate our friends abroad. They unravel proven international alliances. And they're making treaties to dictators, including one who interfered in our elections. They have no issue demonizing those who kneel in peaceful protest while defending those who march with Nazis. And they are not only willing, they are eager to cite religious freedom as a way to undermine progress and fairness and instead exclude, demean, and dehumanize others. Now, in the face of all of this, we have a Republican majority in Congress that is willfully and shamefully complicit, refusing to conduct proper oversight or to hold the Trump administration accountable for its rampant corruption, its stunning incompetence, and its shameful intolerance. Now, here is another difficult truth, one we must face, changing things and specifically changing the makeup of our representation on Capitol Hill, as well as in state capitals, is going to be tougher than ever before. Because that's because more than a half a century after the landmark Voting Rights Act of 1965, for too many Americans, the right to vote and the assurance that every vote is counted fairly remains under siege, whether through gerrymandering, discriminatory voter ID laws, or the purging of the voter rolls, Republicans are doing everything that they can to make it more difficult for our government to express and to execute the will of the people. And their strategy is working. In 2012, 1 1.5 million more Americans cast votes for Democrats for Congress. Yet Republicans won a 33-seat majority. In 2016, despite winning fewer than half of all votes for Congress, Republicans again won a 33-seat majority. Now, the Brennan Center has recently reported that to win back the House this fall, to win even a one-seat majority, Democrats will have to carry the national popular vote by 11 percent. 11 percent. Now, that's not fair, and it's not how our elections are supposed to work. Now, that's why I helped to launch, and I'm proud to chair, the National Democratic Redistricting Committee. With the, with the support of President Obama, you think the country misses him now? With the support of President Obama and other key leaders, we're taking steps to combat gerrymandering and to ensure that voting maps are drawn fairly, just fairly. And through the National Redistricting Foundation, we're bringing lawsuits to challenge unfair maps where they've been drawn illegally. Now, this is very important work. But if we're really, really going to change things, we also need to have an accurate census in 2020. That way, when we redistrict in 2021, the new lines will be drawn in a fair way, not a partisan way so that we end up with legislatures that truly represent the diversity and the priorities of the American people. Now, earlier this year, the National Redistricting Foundation filed a lawsuit supporting individual citizens who live in Maryland, Florida, Texas, Nevada, and Arizona who will be negatively affected by the Commerce Department's decision to add a citizenship question to the 2020 census. Now, let me be clear. Including such a question is con unconstitutional and it would have a devastating decades-long impact. The Constitution requires a count of all persons, not just citizens living in the United States. 
If we don't get an accurate account, if we don't get an accurate account, voters will be denied the right to equitable political representation based on actual population. But they'll also be deprived of their fair share of federal funding for education, infrastructure, health care, public safety, and countless other pressing needs. So I urge all of you to learn more about and to join in the NDRC's work and to support political candidates who stand up for fair districts and for a fair census. This work appeals to our shared American values, and it should unite us. But unfortunately, we can't count on Republicans to join in this effort. So I welcome their help, and I've asked for it. But I haven't found much engagement or any meaningful partnership from those on the other side of the political aisle. Perhaps they're, they're just too busy figuring out how to make America great again. Now, you know, every time I hear that phrase, uh, I wonder, when exactly do they have in mind? What time period do they want to wind the clock back to? What century? What decade? What year? Certainly, it was not when people were enslaved. Certainly, it was not when segregation was the law of the land. Certainly, it was not when women were disenfranchised. Certainly, it was not when the LGBT community was routinely stigmatized. This sort of thinking, this make America great mindset, is not only flawed, it's rooted in fear. And it favors an imagined past over a realistic future. If, if one looks at the the story of America and ignores historic deficiencies or forgets the people denied rights to which all Americans are entitled, then the past can be, for some, for a minority, a comforting place. But that mindset betrays a lack of courage. It speaks to a fear of the future which by its nature is always uncertain. And this is antithetical to who we are as a people. We have always embraced the possibility of the future and not the comfort of the past. That attitude launched the American experiment and has made our nation truly exceptional. And unless you are the descendant of Native people or those who were brought here by force, it's what inspired you or your ancestors to set out for this land of liberty and opportunity. If one looks at the history of our beloved nation, one must conclude that America, with all its problems, but in its totality, was actually at its best just recently. We are not beholden to or held down by a fictional past. Progressives have always looked to the, the future with its possibility of positive change and new challenges and always dared to make it ours. And so it must be again. As the son and grandson of, my, of immigrants, my reverence for America runs deep. Yet, I am clear-eyed about the fact that America's promise of equal opportunity and equitable treatment under the law has not yet been achieved. So we must continue to strive as one nation toward the more perfect union our founders aspired to create. Only by coming together can we realize their vision and write the next great chapter in America's story. It's up to us. It's up to all of us. Everyone in this room and every member of the LGBT community must be committed to ending all forms of discrimination not only on the basis of sexual orientation and gender, but also on the basis of race, religion, ethnicity, and national origin. You must be active in those areas of the struggle as well. You must also bring to bear the full power and the influence that HRC has earned over the years to assist those who have been left out and left behind, people of color, religious minorities, immigrants, young people who fear gun violence in their communities, communities that have been ravaged by addiction, who are rural poor, and a working class that's reeling from cultural, technological, and economic shifts. Now, you're already doing important work in these areas, and I commend you for it, but I challenge you, and I challenge every American who shares our concerns to do even more. Most basically, you must get involved in this current election cycle.
you must vote. On November the 6th, we have the opportunity to send a message to the present occupant of the White House. I never call him the president. The present occupant of the White House. To the present occupant of the White House, to the extremists who surround him, and to those who support him, that we will not allow for the dismantling of the social compact forged by Roosevelt and other great presidents between we the people and our government. Make no mistake, we are in the struggle of our lives and for our democracy. I'm willing and I'm eager to fight for an America that is tolerant, that is fair, and that is just. I'm willing to fight with all of you. I need all of you every step of the way. So let us rise to the challenges of this time, our time. Let us expand our circle of inclusion and not allow small differences to distract us from shared goals. Let us restore what's best about our democracy and lead the way toward a new American era of civic engagement, progress, and justice for all. I want to thank you all for including me this evening, and thank you for giving me hope for the days ahead. Our journey for justice will not be easy, and it may be long, but if we stay committed, if we remain committed to the cause and to one another, I am confident that we will realize our shared dreams and make real our desire for a truly welcoming and open America that will again become an example for all the world. Thank you very much.